Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Iconography of Slavery, an online professional development seminar from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here, and I'll be moderating the session this evening. Before we get underway, I'd like to take a moment just to introduce the National Humanities Center to you. Uh, we're located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, tucked in among the cities of Durham, Raleigh, and Chapel Hill. The center is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Let me see if I can make sense of that for you. First of all, we're independent, means we're a private nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, which means that the main program we offer here is a fellowship program that brings scholars to the center for an academic year from this country and abroad, where they research topics in the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978, and since then, we've had about 1,100 scholars work here, and they've produced about 1,200 books. Now, from that description, you might think the center is an ivory tower, and from these pictures, you see that it could pass for an ivory tower. We even have a spiral staircase going right up through the middle of the place. But the founders didn't want it to be an ivory tower. They wanted it to connect with a wide array of audiences, and they were particularly interested in connecting with teachers. We do that now in three ways, through our online seminars and through two online resources, TeacherServe and our Toolbox Library. Now, you have discovered our online seminars, and we're grateful for that. As you see, we've got several more coming up. Uh, the first, uh, they, they're filling up fast. Our first three have been sold out. <clears throat> and if you want to register for any of the additional seminars, please do, because they are filling up uh, quite quickly. We also offer uh, what we call TeacherServe. This is an umbrella website that contains three instructional guides. And in each instructional guide, you will find essays written by leading scholars that illuminate important topics in three areas of U.S. history. Religion, in the, re in the instructional guide, Divining America. The environment, in Nature Transformed. And African American culture, in Freedom Story. Now, these essays also offer advice on how to teach the topic of the essay. They're very valuable and useful. I invite you to take a look at them. We also offer what we call our toolbox library. These are collections of primary resources. They're really teaching anthologies, consisting of historical documents, literary texts, images, and audio material. They're organized thematically within chronological frames, and they're illuminated by extensive notes and interpretive questions. And they are really ideal for classroom instruction. Now, if you want to know more about the education programs at the National Humanities Center and keep up with new seminars and new online resources, please become a fan of ours on our Facebook page. Delight, we'd be delighted to have you there. In this way, you'd be assured of knowing uh, about new developments that come along from the Humanities Center. Now, let me tell you uh, a little bit about uh, what will happen after the seminar. If you want to uh, hear the, this uh, seminar again, the recording will be available on the same website from which you are able to access your readings. In addition, the PowerPoint will be available also. On this same website, you will find an evaluation, and we ask you please to fill out that evaluation. It is very important to us. You can fill it out and submit it online. We read them, we take them seriously, and we use them to improve the seminars. Let me also invite you to plunder our PowerPoint. It's there for your instructional use. You can take whatever slides you need and introduce the materials into your classes. Now, you're going to get two things from us. First, you're going to get the chance to continue the seminar with Professor McInnes on the forum until October 22nd. We'll be monitoring the forum. She'll be monitoring it. So if it's 2 a.m. tomorrow morning, you come up with an insight or a question that you'd like to bring up, don't, don't call anybody. Instead, go to your computer, go to the forum, and put your insight or question in there. We will see it will respond to you as quickly as we possibly can. You're also going to get documentation of participation. This will be a letter we'll send you that you can submit to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertifica recertification credit your participation in the seminar warrants. Now, here's how the seminar is going to work this evening. Professor McInnes is going to lecture, but she'll be stopping quite often to refer to slides that will contain images and text excerpts that illustrate important points. We will analyze those images and excerpts through discussion. Now, how do you participate in discussion? Well, you can do it in two ways. If you want to speak up, 
click on the little hand raised icon that I'm indicating with my arrow right now. That will tell me that you want to speak up, and at an opportune moment, I will pass the microphone to you. Now, right now, all of your microphone icons have turned are red. But when I pass the microphone to you and your microphone is turned on, it will go green like my microphone icon. You can then hold forth with your comments and questions. I'll mute your microphone for a response. And then please hit the um, hand raised icon again. That will erase the icon next to your name, and you will not run the risk of having me call on you all night when you don't have anything to say. Now, you can also participate by chat. And if you want to chat, put your cursor in the chat box that I'm indicating right now, type your message, and hit the send button right here. Once you've done that, your chat message will appear in the chat box above it. Now, if the chat is distracting you, and it will scroll by if there's a lot of chat rather quickly, then you can click on the arrow that I'm pointing to right now, and that will close the chat panel. But don't worry about missing the chat, because I'll be reading it and following it and bringing it into the conversation as is appropriate. If you want to reopen your chat panel to send a message, just click on that arrow again, and the chat panel will open, and then you'll be able to send your message, and we'll all be able to, uh, to see it. Now, <clears throat> are there any questions before we proceed, ladies and gentlemen? Are we all ready to go? If we're ready to go, why don't you hit that little smiley face icon uh, over from the uh, hand raised icon there, and that will signal to me that we're all ready to go. There we go. Delightful. Okay. Great. So let's get underway then. Our goals are simple. We have two goals this evening. First of all, we want to deepen your understanding of how slavery was depicted in visual imagery and how that imagery was marshaled to oppose slavery. And also, we want to provide some fresh material and ideas to strengthen classroom instruction. Now, we kept track of the form, and basically, the form, there were four themes that loomed large in the form, um, the pre-seminar form. First of all, we wanted to know how to use images to teach slavery and encourage students in research and dialogue. We're going to be able to do that for you tonight. Uh, we should be able to cover that quite well. Secondly, you wanted to know how to encourage students to see slavery not simply as a regional issue, but rather as a national, indeed international problem. I think we'll be able to address that too. Then this, this next one was a, a, a constant theme throughout the forum, how to get students beyond uneasiness, anger, and outrage to a more complex understanding of slavery in the context of its time. Professor McGinnis and I thought about that a great deal, and we have to be perfectly honest with you. We're not experts on teaching uh, K-12 students. We're not entirely sure we can offer a whole lot of advice on how you can get students beyond their uneasiness, anger, and outrage at this very distressing topic. Please, if you have any advice on this, feel free to bring it up in the chat tonight. But probably a more appropriate venue for that would be the forum. So if you have ideas to share about how you get your students beyond their uneasiness, anger, and outrage, please share that with all of us in the forum. Now, our final point, how to explain to students the slaveholding mindset, what we would like you to do this evening is to think about the, the way the images you see this evening reflect a white supremacist mindset, both the pro-slavery and the anti-slavery images. And this is important. Because, of course, the white, supremacist mind, the white supremacist mindset was a fundamental building block of slavery. And I think that if you look for that sort of thing in the images tonight, you will find some ways that you might be able to use the images to help your students understand the slaveholding mindset. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to have with us this evening Mari McGinnis. She's an associate professor of art at the University of Virginia where she is also the Director of American Studies. Her main area of research is American art and material culture. Uh, I've put a few of her publications up there for you, but the one that we are most interested in and the one that I'm undoubtedly she'll be drawing upon tonight is the work she's doing on her forthcoming book, Slaves Waiting for Sale, Visualizing the Southern Slave Trade. So let me turn the seminar over to Maury now. Maury, it's all yours. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome. Um, I'm really looking forward to our conversations this evening um, as, as we um, discuss 
imagery related to depicting slavery. And the images that I chose for our workshop tonight are images that begin with the earliest images depicting slavery and move through to the point in U.S. history um, at the start of the Civil War. And they are images that are created both in Britain and in America, um, and they relate both to the international slave trade as well, to, as well as to slavery on America's shores. And as we move through and talk about the imagery, I want to accomplish um, the, the goals that we set out for the beginning and also something that came up in the forum from a number of you is your wanting to know better how to help students learn how to read images. And I hope that in our own discussions that I'll at least be able to model um, how it is art historians read image and use images as a, another form of text in order to understand the issue and the period that we're looking at. So I will um, open, I'll, as we move forward and we look at images, I will be asking you all questions, and I really hope that some of you will volunteer um, to have the mic turned over to you um, in order to discuss just as if we were in a classroom. Um, we've, I've done several of these, the technology seems to work pretty well, um, but it will rely on your participation. So I'm hoping that many of you will feel comfortable doing that. Um, as I was reading the forum questions, um, and Richard and I were talking about this earlier, you know, I am in such a different situation from each of you. And I can't imagine how difficult it would be to have to teach slavery in a K-12 classroom. I have young children myself, and I try very often um, to deal with this with them, and, and it's tough. It's a very hard thing um, to do what it is you all were saying, how you get them beyond the outrage. I'm in a different situation. By the time students come to me in my classrooms at the University of Virginia, they have benefited from teachers like yourselves. They have the historical background, um, and they've come to my classes because they do want to learn more. Um, but maybe um, in discussions with each other, um, you all can help each other figure out how to do that best. So let's go ahead and start with the, the meat of the seminar um, and begin with these first two images. And I'd like to go ahead and give you a, um, just a, a very brief introduction to them. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over um, and we're going to discuss the questions that, that I have on the PowerPoint and discussion questions. Um, these two images, both created in Britain um, by the first anti-slavery group that came together in Britain in order to try to stop the international slave trade. That is the purchase of Africans, um, placing them on ships to be transported to the New World, um, that event that we often refer to as the Middle Passage. And it was a group of um, British men who first started um, the movement that we now often refer to very generally as abolitionism. Um, they tended to call it at the time anti-slavery. And these are first, two of the first images created that in any way reference slavery. Now, slavery, of course, had been going on for centuries at this point, um, but it took a long time before there was any imagery. So, I want you, looking at these two messages, to tell me what message you think these images conveyed about slavery. Okay, Maria, while folks are thinking that, Robert has uh, asked the microphone, so let me pass it to him. Robert, uh, you have a question or comment? Well, he might, but apparently um, the technology that we were talking about working so well is not, not cooperating there. So let me um, mute that microphone. Robert, I'm sorry that it's not working for you. Perhaps you want to uh, to, to uh, check in with the chat. So um, there was a, Richard, there's a question going on in the chat that I'd like to answer. Um, okay. One of the participants asked, if slavery had existed for a while and a long while, about 1798, why did it take so long for anti-slavery interests to speak out? 
the question really should be, why did it take so long for there to be anti-slavery interest? There is not a very significant anti-slavery movement until the end of the 18th century. Um, there had been some murmurings among the Quakers, um, but there really wasn't a much broader movement than that. So these images coincide with the birth of anti-slavery activity. So right. as we look at these images and we think about really the birth of an anti-slavery movement um, and of depicting slavery, um, what messages do these images convey to you? Okay. We have a question here. Um, I've heard that the drawing is not accurate. Do you agree? I assume that's the drawing of the slave ship. So could you comment on the accuracy of, of that? Well, the, the question would really be what what accuracy? Mm -hmm. Accurate in what way? Accurate in what way? Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. It's, it's overdone. Um, uh, Mr. Rookie is saying that it may be overdone, uh, stated perhaps for propaganda purposes. And Jews Batten <clears throat> writes about how the, the depiction of the slave ship, ship was designed to, uh, to uh, emphasize the inhumanity of the slave trade. Very good. What, I'd, I'd like to hear more before I talk much more. Okay. Any further comments about these two images? What, what messages are they conveying about the slave trade? Okay. Well, certainly uh, the the one on the right, the uh, medallion, that's that's emphasizing uh, the humanity, I would think, of uh, slavery. Uh, you've got the classic icons there, the, the chains and uh, the uh, supplicate, supplicatory uh, posture there. Okay. Right. So these are two distinctly different images, both created at the same time, both hoping to achieve a similar purpose, which was a political movement to try to end Britain's participation in the slave trade. Britain was not the only nation involved in the international slave trade. Um, many other nations, particularly uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish, are probably the other two biggest um, traders. And but Britain is, by the end of the 18th century, the, the, the nation most involved in the slave trade. And what the anti-slavery activists were trying to do was twofold. They were hoping to end outright the, slave, the trade in slaves. And if not, they at least wanted to be able to improve the condition for slaves in ships. And so their strategy for trying to bring attention to this issue in the left-hand image was to go to the very accurate drawings that were part of naval architecture, that were part of the basic way in which ships were depicted in the 18th century, to use that scientific accuracy and then to demonstrate how densely packed many slave ships, many slave trade ships were with slaves. And many of you were pointing that out in your chat lines, that the emphasis, um, uh, as, as I'm reading the chat here, on numbers, the idea of packing in as many bodies as possible. And indeed, in historical accounts, we know that many traders did that. They packed in as many bodies as they could Slaves basically did not have room to stand up, to move around, and the death rate in, as slaves were moved from Africa to the New World are just terrifying. And so they were at least trying to ameliorate the conditions on slave ships or hopefully in the slave trade outright. In the medallion that was created, so this a member of the London anti-slavery group was um, uh, Josiah Wedgwood, who was a, uh, an entrepreneur and an early industrialist. Many of you are probably familiar with Wedgwood China, as we might call it. And he had one of his modelers make this medallion um, that 
then anti-slavery activists could wear. They could pin it to their clothing and essentially wear their anti-slavery stance on their sleeve, um, so to speak. And it really has a very different emphasis than the other one. Um, it speaks more to a single person rather than the other image, which just shows stacks of bodies. Um, and some of you are talking about um, uh, one image being more effective than the other. And I'd like you to respond, perhaps, in words, if someone's willing to give their microphone a go, what aspects of the images do you think are effective, and which one do you think might have changed more opinions? It's a good question. Um, particularly if we think about it in the context of the time, 1798, which one? I, I, think, I think today, probably, um, yeah, the one on the left, but I wonder if the people who were viewing that in 1798, obviously they don't have the same mindset we do. So I wonder which one was more effective and what might have been perhaps a more sentimental time. But let's hear. I mean, uh, that Walker has said the image on the left. Uh, yeah, so someone, can you imagine wearing the medallion in the South? Well, no. <laughs> Why do you think uh, the one on the left might have been more effective? If indeed you do. Let's hear from the people who want to vote for the one on the right. Okay. Initially, there are probably not as many people who are emotionally connected to the issue. Good point. Yeah. The image on the right seems to force the viewer to consider the individual, though still seems racist by today's standards. In what way do you suppose? And Richard, I think we have Robert who is going to try the microphone. Actually, I think Robert, let's try that. Robert, do you have a a um, a comment you want to make? Okay, I think actually, Robert, uh, here we go. Yvette does. Let's pass the microphone to her. Yvette, the microphone's yours. Uh, okay, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. we are. Okay, uh, I am... First of all, I'm, I'm not certain of the appeal, who the audience is supposed to be for the image on the right. And I'm questioning because it would appear, the, the most that I can get is that it would be a Christian appeal. And so I'm questioning that because Christianity was a base for slavery. So I'm uncertain of what the purpose of the image would be and who is exactly supposed to be appealing to. So Question. The topic of slavery within the Christian religion in the 18th and 19th century is one on which there is not broad agreement. There will develop uh, Christians who argue that slavery is against Christianity and not consistent with the beliefs, and there are those who will argue that it is in fact sanctioned by the Bible because slavery is mentioned so often within the Bible. Um, and so there are very different opinion on that matter. And so indeed, the medallion was meant to the anti-slavery movement in Britain in 1798 is um, a group of white Britons who are trying to appeal to other white Britons, mostly politicians trying to appeal to other politicians, um, wanting to get them to end the slave trade. Okay, Vic, do you have any other uh, comments to make? You want to respond? Um, yes. I am, I guess I would respond to the fact that there is a difference in opinion when there is fact to support that the Catholic Church um, condoned slavery or, so to speak, gave it, gave it an okay, and that was when it actually became a more widespread practice. Um, so I guess I'm a little stuck on on you know, there being a difference in opinion as to whether or not Christianity was the basis of the slave trade. It seems to me that that would displace, you know, the difference in opinion. Well, of course, Christianity in the 18th and 19th century is a broad and diverse uh, category covering Christians of many different faiths. And not all were in agreement in the sense um, of the Christ that the Catholic Church held. There were many Protestant sects, and especially the Quakers, 
um, who are really the first Christian sect to be strongly in opposition to slavery. Okay, we have some other comments here. Greg Howes, let me pass the microphone to him. Greg, it's all yours. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, what I understand, it's not really, even though in America we have it as a religious movement, much of the movement in Europe is actually a result of the Enlightenment and reason that people across the lines came because of the alignments of um, the new constitution, even in France, because they're going through the revolution. Um, there is certainly a, an important element of Enlightenment philosophy um, that led some people to oppose slavery. Um, but at the same time, there were important Enlightenment thinkers um, in our country, such as Thomas Jefferson, who, while he was more, would write that he was morally opposed to slavery, um, did nothing to try to end it on American shores. It is a topic on which um, there is such, um, you know, ambiguity and contradiction within many people's own belief system um, that that question that many of you are struggling to get at, which is trying to understand the slaveholder's mindset. Um, is an extremely complicated issue that can't fully be explained by solely by any one category, whether it be religion or politics um, or geography or time period. Okay, let's see. We have Emily has a question. All right, Emily, you have the microphone. Okay, I just wanted to mention that the left-hand uh, image looks a little bit more like it's objective and they're just trying to present information, whereas obviously there's sort of the emotional appeal of the medallion on the right. And so, you know, if we're kind of comparing the two, I see them as sort of serving two different purposes, but, you know, I don't know what it's like traveling in a ship in jail. So I don't know if you know, these are especially horrid conditions or, you know, uh, kind of the historical comparison there. But I just wanted to mention those things. Yes, those are very good points. Um, and that was much of what the point of the description of a slave ship was trying to get across. It was trying to use the, essentially what is, you could uh, sort of link it with enlightenment a desire to understand, to document, and by using the sort of measurements and the scientific accuracy, it was meant to give that sort of objective view of the conditions. But of course, the conditions as they are presented miss any of the real horror of those conditions, right? It sort of objectively presents the fact that it's very crowded, but it doesn't include all of the horrible outcomes of that crowdedness, the disease, the hunger, um, the number of people who died, the lack of fresh air, um, and the emotional anguish, of course, of having been stolen from your home and placed on this ship um, and sold into slavery. Okay, Greg, do you have any further comments? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, shall we move on then? Yes, why don't we move to the next image? Well, before you leave these, let me make two points. So these early images set up sort of two different ways of looking, of depicting slavery. And they both are establishing ways of depicting the slave that will carry on for decades and that influence significantly the way that white anti-slavery activists um, both think of and understand slaves. So in the left image, the slaves are represented really not as individuals. They are counted. They are bodies exactly the same next to each other. Um, and in the image on the right, the figure is shown, as Richard mentioned earlier, as a supplicant slave. He's kneeling, his hands and wrists are bound by chains. He is not capable 
of achieving his own freedom or liberation. He is instead kneeling and pleading for a white intercessor, and that is a white anti-slavery individual, to help him out. This is not the active slave. This is the passive slave. And that is a way of depicting a slave that holds on for a long time. We have a question. When did African or African American begin speaking out against slavery? The earliest, there are a few very early publications. Um, a former slave who achieved his freedom and lives in Britain publishes the first account, I believe, right around this time. It's in the late 18th century. It may be a few years after this image. And there are a few other late 18th, early 19th century um, sort of autobiographies and memoirs and narratives, but a very small number. It is really not until you get farther into the 19th century, the 1840s and 50s, thank you, that's the right answer, 1789. Um, it's not until you get to the 1840s and 1850s that you start to see a huge number of published former slave narratives and a number of former slave anti-slavery activists. The most famous is, of course, Frederick Douglass, but there are many, many others. Um, and we can easily point you to web resources um, that have all of those books and narratives digitized and available for your use. Right, and let me just add, too, that if you go to our website, Freedom Story, you will find some excellent essays on how to read a slave narrative and also about slave narratives uh, of Frederick Douglass and uh, 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 others as well. So let's move on to what became one of the most images frequently seen in American newspapers and American broadsides. Um, so the, the slave ship and the am I not a man and a brother were images that were created in the late 18th century and then replicated over and over and over and over again. Um, for the remainder of the period that slavery existed in America. The other and the third probably most iconic image is this image here um, labeled the runaway. It is shown here, this particular one comes from an anti-slavery newspaper, um, but you could find it not only in anti-slavery newspapers, but also in slavery, you know, in regular newspapers, you know, the newspaper that you would pick up in the morning um, to get the news of the world would have advertisements in the back announcing the runaway of slaves and announcing sometimes the sale of slaves, and they would use the exact same icon. So let's look at a runaway slave advertisement. There are, of course, thousands of these throughout the history of American slavery. Um, and I'd like to read a little bit of it, of it and have you think about what message about slavery do you think both the ad conveys and the image conveys. And so it's very common that a runaway slave ad will um, give the name of the individual followed by the age, as we see here, and then a physical description. They usually discuss skin color, whether somebody's tall or short, um, how slim, and then any physical characteristics. For Peter, who ran away in 1769, that included that he had a teeth that were out. And then he's described as a sly and artful rogue. And when we finish, I'll be interested for, to hear what you think was meant by that. And then he carried with him sundry assorted clothes. And I noticed that one of you asked, what's in the bag? Well, usually um, in most of these slave advertisements, you will find that it will describe that slaves have taken a number of changes of clothes with them. Here, he is wearing clothes such as were typically given to slaves by their owners to work in the field. He also carried a gun and a fiddle. And then it says that he's very talkative and impudent. And then it gives details about 
where he thinks he's gone, in this case to Amelia County, and he mentions some people whom he knew in Amelia County. So what are some of the lessons about Peter in particular, um, and maybe more generally about runaway slaves that you get from that? While we're waiting for a response, um, uh, one of our participants has suggested that the bag might have suggested thievery, which is an interesting comment because to white slaveholders looking at the bag, it probably did indicate thievery. So let's see. Melissa's got her hand up. Melissa, microphone's yours. Well, some, something I was noticing, and I, I'm sorry, my, my kids are in here watching <laughs> cartoons, but hey, Mama's talking. Um, you know, it says that they, he, he took all this stuff with him and, and, you know, he's got a fiddle and he has a gun. And I, I may be wrong in my conceptions, but I always thought that if if there was a runaway, they were running, you know, for good reason. I mean, they were slaves, but it's, I'm trying to think how to explain it. It just seems odd to me that he would supposedly have all of this stuff with him because the way I understood it, they took the clothes on their back and their family and they made a break for it, so to speak. So I didn't know if this was accurate or not. Good point. Thank you. Maury? Um, I think it probably is very accurate. One of the things that we've learned in our study of slavery that has changed some of the conceptions we held for many years is that more often than not, slaves are running away in order to get back to family. So if you look at this, he's probably gone to Amelia County where he had previously lived. And so he's probably trying to get back to family members um, that he had been sold away from. He is carrying a gun, which you wouldn't think he would own, but he doesn't describe it as being stolen, um, so that's possible. And the fiddle probably is an indication that he was a musician, and that fiddle was probably considered his, and he was probably expected in many instances to perform as a musician for his owners um, or other whites, but also was able to use that um, for his own purposes as well. I was particularly interested in the fact that he was carrying his wife's clothes, which could suggest that he's going back to uh, Mrs. Tanner's plantation where his wife is, or that, those are, that he's carrying that as a disguise. And we certainly see other runaway advertisements where they say that they, you know, took particular clothing with them and they wouldn't be surprised if they try to hide and be in disguise. And there's some very famous escapes where um, some men dress up as women, works more often that way than the other way, and manage to escape um, in, that, in, in the disguise of a woman. We have an interesting comment. One thing the ad suggests is that the owner knows a lot about Peter, or presumes to know. It also uses slave owner code words, impudent, sly. It's also pretty obvious the slave owner wants him back. He's a relatively high value slave. That's right. Good That's point. A very good observation. And the impudent and sly is usually, those are usually code words for, um, you know, he's very smart and he's going to be able to, uh, uh, to, to get away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of represent the natural selection of the slaves who would escape. I mean, the, the ones who, you know, weren't so bright or lazy would be, would stay on the plantation, but it was the impudent and sly and clever ones that, uh, that made their break. Here we have a question. Would the artwork be more active if it displayed a slave escaping during darkness? It would be. It would be, because more often slaves would escape under the cover of night. Um, but the limitations of woodcut, which is what we're looking at here, um, if you had a black background, it would be very difficult to um, then also have the slave figure. So some of that is a limitation of what the artwork can accomplish. Mm -hmm. And Mary Ogden notes that some of the descriptions are referred to tattoos which uh, in certain situations could, could, could hide someone and in other situations might give someone away as a, as a runaway slave. That's right. And when you read the descriptions about tattoos, as um, Mary MacDogden points out, sometimes those are tattoos that relate to um, tattoos that are cho chosen and might indicate 
the tribal origins of uh, more recent African um, slaves. And others were tattoos put on them by slave owners as a form of branding. As we read runaway, runaway advertisements, you see that often in the 18th century, very infrequently in the 19th century. It seems to be a practice that um, goes out of favor. Um, so let's go ahead and move on from the runaway. The, the runaway is important to keep in mind because it's such an iconic image that you see over and over again. And it's one that stood in opposition to the slave owners who tried to put forth arguments that slaves were happy and content. And all you had to do was look in any southern newspaper, um, any you know, southern or northern newspaper in the 18th century before most northern states outlawed slavery. Um, and southern newspapers after that point, and you will see runaway notices go lower um, that really stand in opposition to the pro-slavery stance of happy and contented. Somebody asked the percentage. I don't know that anybody's ever run any numbers on that. So I'm afraid I can't answer that one. Did the ads on runaway slaves increase after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850? Um, I don't know that they really increased um, in number because there are just so many throughout the whole period. So let's move forward and look at much more difficult issues. Um, uh, yes, to answer the question before we move on, the, did the ads ever mention scars such as whipping scars as identifying marks or did owners avoid referring to such negatives? They did not in runaway slave notices at all shy away from. Um, mentioning things like scars that slaves might have received um, from punishment. Um, their audience is mostly other slave owners. Um, it's mostly other Southerners reading Southern newspapers, um, and they have no hesitation in sharing that information. Um, and as Yvette points out, the appearance of scars to a slave owner might suggest a rebellious slave to an anti-slavery activist would suggest a um, horrific owner who chose to use a whip to punish his slaves. And in some ways, that works as a very good um, segue into the two next two images we're looking at. Um, these are you know, extremely difficult images, um, ones that I would not necessarily imagine that you would show to a K-12 audience but they formed one of the major themes that anti-slavery activists chose to depict um, in imagery. It, it begins being depicted late in the 18th century by British artists and continues well into the 19th century um, from the pens of both British and American artists. We have two examples here. The one on the left is American. The one on the right is British. Um, and I would just like you to think about same subject, the to physical torture of slaves. And yet the artists have treated the images very differently in some ways and similarly in other ways. What are some of the differences and similarities you notice and how do those create different messages? Okay. <clears throat> Two very different images. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here we, Robert points out what's shocking is the disproportionate excessive nature of the whippings, which makes one think they might not be true, but they are. So the, the, the exaggeration of the paintings, of the, of the images, uh, well, they're not exaggerated. Right. Notice the two images show distinctions between the distance of the oppressor and the one being oppressed. Good point. The image on the left seems to focus more on the behavior of white people, while the image on the right focuses on the experience of the woman. Notice, too, the image on the uh, right, or rather on the left, really emphasizes the public nature of the whipping. This is, you know, to, show, to teach somebody a lesson. Altogether, there are 13 people in that uh, engraving. Uh, on the other one, there are just five. So this is, and, and clearly the, the uh, flogging is taking place in front of families. So that's, that's an act of terror. That's definitely meant to send a message. 
you all are making some great observations um, to continue from where Richard was reading. The image on the right certainly has an erotic quality. No doubt about it. Um, one of the things that is very noticeable in a lot of the imagery, especially a lot of the imagery produced in Britain, is there is very often this linkage between eroticism and slavery. And one of the things that we know from the accounts of former slaves is how very often women were forced into sexual relationships either with their masters um, or other whites, whether it was an overseer or, or other people in the area. And the British, you know, while they might have known that, that was also in a way um, erotic to them, and it very often appears in the imagery. Um, other comments that you made, um, that it seems to be a group event, um, and that there are churches in the background. And that is meant to point out to those that they're, you know, either their fellow anti-slavery activists or the people they're hoping to turn into anti-slavery activists, that many of the slave owners who profess to be Christian are involved in the physical abuse of slaves. And so that's why that combination um, of the two. Um, question about the less the men having their right hand raised and the left over their heart. I hadn't noticed that before. That's a great observation. I don't really know how to answer what that indicates. Um, and then the gendered notions of racial inferiority. There, there is, and another of you asked what made it erotic. Um, I think what makes it erotic is the depiction of a woman um, nearly naked in a position where she can in no way control or defend herself. And there is no doubt that there is a difference in anti-slavery imagery between how women are depicted and how men are depicted. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about more comments or questions on these before we move on? What would you say, Mari, about the, the background uh, on the picture on the left, the, the what looks like a church or a government building back there? And then it yeah, tends to be I, I think those are small. meant to be churches, and they're meant to point to the um, hypocrisy as anti-slavery activists would see it, of somebody professing to be Christian um, and then whipping slaves. Okay, Yvette has her hand up. Let me pass the microphone. Yvette, it's all yours. Yes, I wanted... Uh, uh, to get more clarification about what makes the image erotic, particularly since that is, from what I answer, the fiction as far as they quite often did strip the women, especially strip them naked. So, if what makes that image erotic? I'm just trying to understand. Okay. All right. Well, you know, in some ways, this gets into um, psychology. The stripping of women naked. Um, many would argue was itself erotic for many of the men involved in that activity. Um, when you talk about eroticism and pornography, it very often has an element of violence to it. And I think, too, I mean, she's depicted as, as, as having a rather voluptuous body. I mean, and she's in a, in a position that curves her body. So... Uh, uh, as, as one participant pointed out, there is a kind of grace to the way she's she's hanging there. Obviously, she's suffering, but the way the artist has depicted it, there's a kind of uh, a graceful movement there. I mean, if you if you obscured the, the branch she, and her hands, she could almost be dancing. And depicted very much like a Venus figure, um, a figure that was well known um, as a great beauty and meant to have an erotic pleasure. Um, the only difference here being that it is a slave bound and having been whipped by the man we see in the background. Right. Uh, Yvette's got her hand up again. Let's pass the microphone. Yvette, do you have a further comment? Uh, I, just didn't, I, I just didn't cut my um, mic oh, okay. off. I, I don't 
Okay. I don't agree, but it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, and then Greg Hauser notes here that the body is rather similar to a Venus, and that's 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 a, I think a good point as well. Emily, uh, do you have a question? Let me pass the microphone to you, Emily. Yes, uh, I was just wondering why uh, in that image the woman is so much larger than um, the men who are whipping her. I mean, is that kind of an implication that uh, you know that? fact that they're whipping her is going to actually undo, you know, them or it's going to have some negative impact on them and I'm just trying to figure that out a little bit more. Okay. All right. I think this is a choice where an artist is using the visual appeal of a bound slave woman um, as the kind of end to attract uh, viewers. Uh, the people who are meant to be looking at this are not women. Um, this is a publication that would have gone primarily to the then male anti-slavery activist, active in Britain when this image was produced. It is probably 20 or 30 years after this before women become the kind of primary movers and shakers in anti-slavery activity. Robert Nair notes that both seem to imply some sort of parallel with Christ's agony and sacrifice on Calvary. Is there something the abolition is this something the abolitionists write about? It's an excellent visual observation. Um, it is not something that I recall running into um, abolitionists writing about. They talk much about the sufferings of slaves, um, but I don't recall seeing a linkage. Um, with Christ suffering, but that doesn't mean that it's not there, because um, I haven't read everything that abolitionists have written, so that's a, a possibility. And if anybody knows of such an instance, will you please share it with Robert? Okay. And let's go ahead and move on um, to the next two images, um, images that take up an entirely different message and theme from the images related to torture. Um, and as you look at these two images, I'd like you to think about what the new message is um, and how it is the artist is portraying it. Okay. What new message do we see here? We're beginning to move into Harriet Beecher Stowe country here. Okay. Any comments? <clears throat> here we go. Uh, what does the picture on the left say? That's uh... Okay, so it says the text immediately under it is the driver's whip unfolds its torturing coil. She only sulks, go lash her to her toil. Um, and then there's a, a longer point beneath it. The comments on the chat are noting that now the theme is separating families. Right. It is, it may seem to us a really obvious point, but it, it doesn't really emerge as a subject for anti-slavery activists until 1826 in Britain when a group of women anti-slavery activists, or a, a group of women become active in the anti-slavery movement. Prior to that, the anti-slavery movement had been primarily men, and it was primarily focused on ending the slave trade. The slave trade, the international slave trade, ends for Britain in 1807, for America in 1808, and then the focus shifts. Women become involved, and they become involved in wanting to end not the slave trade, but slavery itself. And as part of that, they move to a focus on how slavery affected women. And once they made the, the move to women, it moved to families. And the imagery shifts from representing women in these positions of being tortured, but more importantly moves to imagery where slave women are represented as mothers. 
many of you have made connections to a lot of things. There's been lots of chat going on, which is great. Um, and I'm not going to be able to read them all. Um, showing the horrors of breaking up families, the dissolution of the family, ripping families apart. And I think the image on the right, which um, is appeared in an American anti-slavery almanac, um, literally is showing them ripping apart, pulled apart. Um, is the point on the picture? Yes. Yeah, so the picture, the point of the picture on the left is that she is being whipped, or the threat of being whipped for having stopped in order to take care of her child. And it is indeed another um, African American male who is being shown here as the overseer who has the whip in his hand. And this image on the left was one where it imagined the slavery to be taking place in the British colonies in what they called then the West Indies. Um, this is most likely representing um, an incident on the island of Jamaica. And the child, I mean, the way that the child is depicted there, clearly the child needs some care. And the mother um, apparently doesn't have a shirt on. She may have been nursing the child. Right. I think that is what we are supposed to take away from uh -huh. that. Is there anything about the depiction of the mother and child that reminds you of other imagery? Anything there that we've seen before? Not here, but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Madonna and child, exactly. Right. The artist has specifically turned to centuries of representing the mother and child, the Madonna and child, um, as a way of reminding readers of not only their own Christian duty, but the fact that slaves were now Christian too. Not all of them, but Christianity is spreading very quickly among slaves, and it becomes part of the argument that anti-slavery activists use in support of their cause. See, Emily has her hand up. Let's pass the microphone to Emily. Emily, do you have a question or a comment? Oh, no, sorry. I can't turn off the... Okay, just hand click up. the hand raised icon again and it'll disappear. Sorry. Okay, right. Marsh, shall we move on? Let's move on. There are many, many slave narratives that where you can find textual discussions um, about the ripping apart of slave families as well. Um, just one short example from the readings that you had. Um, the narrative of William W. Brown, um, first published in 1849, uh, a great, really great read. Um, and he writes that experience has taught me nothing can be more heartrending than for one to see a dear and beloved mother or sister tortured um, and to hear their cries and not be able to render them assistance, but such is the position which an American slave occupies. Um, and we find quite often in slave narratives that you hear most of the slave narratives, most of the published slave narratives are written by men, and they very often focus on this destruction of the family or of things that have happened to their mothers, wives, sisters, children that they can't do anything about, that they have no power to stop. And one of the themes that becomes very important in these anti-slavery texts is the sale of slaves and the sale of slaves in America comes to be represented by the event known as the slave auction. And on the screen are two of the earliest of those slave auctions. Um, and I would like you to look at these two and see what impression of an auction did the artist seem to be interested in um, and what stories do they seem to be telling? And what do you think might be missing? So one of the people writes about the inspections that slaves had to go through. Um, another person writes of the make-believe. Um, 
and we'll come back to the images themselves. I want us to look a little bit at the text because both of the things that you're talking about we find over and over again in the text. So this from Solomon Northup, um, his narrative is an amazing tale. He was a free black who was kidnapped and sold into slavery in 1841, and it took him 12 years um, to get to freedom again. He writes about um, his experiences, including being sold through a slave auction. So he writes about washing thoroughly, um, being furnished with new clothing, and then, um, as you were talking about the inspections, conducted into a large room in the front part of the building in order to be properly trained, the men arranged, on one side, the women on the other, tallest place at the head of the row and then put in height order, um, and then threatening them, the owner, threatening them unless they were practiced in the art of, quote, looking smart. They were made to move with exact precision. In these yeah. images, Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that in the chat we had some questions about or some comments about the image on the right. People noted, obviously, the magnificent building. And some people thought it might be a legal building, suggesting legal sanction. Other people thought it might be a church, suggesting a kind of uh, another version of establishment uh, sanction. And then finally, people have noticed that uh, the architecture suggests the uh, vast economic wealth that stood behind the slave system. All oh, very excellent observations. Um, the image on the right is published in a British book um, from a British traveler who came to America and wrote about what he saw as he traveled through the slave state. The artist who made the image never actually saw the place that he drew. He was drawing from the author's description of the place. And the place that that author was describing was in New Orleans. New Orleans was the city in America in which the greatest number of slaves were sold. Once the international slave trade closed in 1807, a strong and vigorous internal slave trade arose, and slaves were sometimes sold um, you know, from one owner to another in a single county. But probably even more often, sold to a dealer who would take them far away. So for example, slaves were quite often gathered up in the counties of the Upper South in Virginia, such as the auction at Richmond that we see on the left-hand side, sold to a slave trader who then would either march them or put them on a boat or a train to take to the Deep South quite often to New Orleans, where they would be sold. And we do know that in New Orleans, the two most magnificent hotels there, um, the St. Charles and the St. Louis, were used as sites of slave auctions. And in fact, one of those hotels had a rotunda interior not that dissimilar to the image on the right. And so there is a sort of official sanction of slave auctioning. It, um, you know, it's a business, it's registered, it's taxed, and it takes place in one of the grandest architectural settings in the city. That is not true in Richmond, where it tended to take place in, um, uh, in a sort of side alley and nondescript buildings located there. Um, it was not a building designed for slave auctions, so I'm answering some of the questions now. It was a hotel, but it was, it was used for this purpose six days a week. Um, and looking smart, or, uh, let's see, I can imagine this problem meant appearing to be docile and easily controlled. Exactly. So looking smart was acting in the way that white slave owners would want a slave to act. And exactly as you say, being easy to control. Um, the Richmond auction setting resembles livestock auction. Yes, a very good point. Um, with the slave trade not open in Washington with no formal building. The slave trade was um, 
was active in Washington, D.C. until 1850, when as part of the Compromise of 1850, um, it was outlawed in the district. Um, what are some other things about the auction um, that are not depicted that you think would have been part of the event? While the participants are thinking about that, <clears throat> someone notes here that uh, women are participating in the slave auction, and that seems uh, odd. Was that odd? Did, were these were these social events too that would bring out people who might not necessarily be in the market for slaves? A very good question. The image of auction at Richmond on the left is very unusual in that it does show women, and it's one of the very few that has a large number of women in the image. Um, what we know from accounts is the sale of slaves took place typically in a number of places, either in auction rooms, like the one that's depicted here, or in most counties at the courthouse. It was common when people died and their estate needed to be sold and turned into cash that slaves would be sold. And that was very often done outdoors in front of the courthouse. And at those events, we know that women were quite typically present. Inside the slave auction room, in a place like Richmond, that was much less common and it would be rare for women to be there. It was usually slave traders and a few planters. And in response to your question about what's missing, Yvette writes that the beatings the slaves received after the auctions when they weren't sold, and of course these images do not depict the humiliation that the slaves uh, suffered. Exactly. Um, what is missing is the horror and the cruelty. And that is true of virtually all of the anti-slavery imagery that depicts auctions. They create this kind of triangle that you almost always see an auction with his hand overhead. Um, as Robert's writing, these images are orderly, almost stay. You see the same scene enacted over and over again. And in many ways, it's rather theatrical. You get a sense of the drama of the event, the going, going, gone, the prices going higher and higher. And you see that in a lot of the ways that people write about it also. And it removes all of that emotional horror that we run into again and again in former slave narratives. Um, there's a question about on the image on the right, selling other goods. Yes, um, we know that it was quite often in this hotel in New Orleans. They, you know, one auction would sell slaves, the next one would sell artworks, the next one would sell wine. Um, it was just a large commodity auction. Um, and then you're surprised to read that slaves were dressed up for sale because most of the images I have seen, including the one on the right, is that slaves are wearing nothing more than simple loincloth. That imagery of the loincloth is used early on but does not depict the reality of slave auctions in America in the 19th century. In fact, we know from description after description that Slaves were dressed up very well before, slave, before sales, and that it was about, in many ways, turning them into a product that people would want to buy. And slave dealers actually spent a lot of money um, on dressing up slaves, almost always buying a new set of clothes for them, and usually clothes much nicer than they would have had it regularly. So as you all are commenting, dressed up to look good, nicely packaged commodity, um, that is indeed how it was treated. Um, again, from oh, that's Solomon Northup. Um, uh, let's look at another uh, slave auction image um, and think of it and um, how these images were received. So the images we looked at were both from books. And a lot of the imagery that is created about slavery is in books or newspaper. And in most of those, they are anti-slavery newspapers or anti-slavery books. And so the people who are looking at them are already assumed to 
be sympathetic with the topic, right? Is, you know, somebody who already is opposed to slavery looking at imagery and getting more evidence for why they are opposed to slavery. Their hope, of course, was that somebody new would read it and that their opinion would be changed. One sculptor by the name of John Rogers tried to take his anti-slavery attitude to a much broader audience. He made small sculptures. They were typically about 12 inches high. And people would buy these small sculptures um, to put on their mantelpiece, on a table in the living room. And most of the ones he sold were sentimental images. They might show um, a, a mother and her child. They might show two boys playing checkers. They were, you know, sentimental images. So he tried to make one of a slave auction. And he took it to the people who normally sold his sculptures, and they said, no way. Not even going to sell it. Why not? And this is in New York City. So to that question that a number of you asked in the forum about how do I get them to see that slavery was a national issue, here's another reason. Here's another topic for that. New York dealer wouldn't sell it. Why? Okay. Some, one of you said the subject is depressing. Um, that could indeed be part of it. I think there's probably a more political motivation behind it. This is uh, 1859 after John Brown's raid at Christmas uh, time. Jesse Morgan Owens, um, I think has hit the nail on the head. It might have been the slave money in New York City. Ah, uh, yes. It's important to remember that the cotton that is grown in the South by slaves is then sold, and most of the brokers who are making the money from the sale of cotton that then goes quite often to New England mills where it is turned into clothing, um, most of that money is being made in New York City. And New York City is actually a very pro-South city. So um, the country being on the brink of war, um, now of course nobody yet knows, and it's important when we're teaching history that we uh, resist that urge to move forward, because Abraham Lincoln hasn't been elected yet, but um, John Brown's raid on Harper Ferry, Harper's Ferry has taken place. And so certainly everybody is nervous about the topic of slavery um, and what that means. Um, what do you all think about the depiction of this slave auction in comparison to the ones that we were looking at before? What's different about this one? Can you say, um, Angela, it's interesting that these enslaved people do not look physically dissimilar from the average New York citizen. The gentleman in bondage looks formidable. And the Dred Scott case, another very good mm -hmm. point to the, the tensions at the time. Uh -huh. Going the whole family. Right. Yep. Um, I think the formidable is a very important comment because what we – don't often see, as you all are pointing out, is that there is the emotional bond being show, show, shown between the mother and the child, and that formidable expression from the male slave was rarely seen in anti-slavery imagery. This one is almost a little too correct in its display of emotion, and that is something that to some people um, would have been unsettling. So that's why we, I think we often don't see it in those more um, staid images from before are the more typical. Mm -hmm. And Mary Ogden knows that it seems more sterile because it lacks all the background imagery found in the earlier pictures. Right. Um, so let's look at another quote and then we'll move on um, to our, some, some more images. Um, and this one is in fact getting at um, some of the other things that you all were mentioning is often not shown. Um, the horror, the anger, the emotional aspect that was very hard for artists or very infrequently depicted by artists. The fact that, quote, one member of a family will be torn from another. The agony 
at parting. These must be seen and felt to be fully understood. Um, and that was something that the artists, all of whom are white, most of whom are not American, have a hard time depicting. It's hard for them to figure out how to depict the horror of the event um, in a way that communicates the emotions without being so horrific that you can't look at it. Um, so let's look uh, a little bit at two other images. I know some of you were asking in the forum about the mindset of uh, slaveholders. And while this isn't really the focus here, you can see in these two images two different depictions of the mindset. So these images both came out in 1850, just after the passage of the controversial Fugitive Slave Act that was part of that compromise bill um, of 1850. Um, one depicts the effects of the Fugitive Slave Law in a very negative light, and the other not specifically answering the Fugitive Slave Act, but presenting a pro-slavery view of um, of slavery, a, a positive view. So let's look first at the effects of the Fugitive Slave Law. And the quotes that they included on this image, one from the Holy Bible and one from the Declaration of Independence. Um, and we quite often see these texts being pulled forth in opposition to slavery. And what we see here in this image are a group of pursuers in the background, and then a number of slaves who are trying to run away in the foreground who have been shot by their pursuers. You can kind of just see the smoke coming from the gun um, and the man behind. Then in the kind of pro-slavery image at the same time, the way many Southerners defended slavery was to try to put forth the idea that slaves were well treated. And they often contrasted that with the plight of wage laborers, that is, people who worked in mills and industry in either England or in the North. And so they have a series of quotes um, which you can read. And I won't read them all out loud because you can always come back and read them at your leisure. But what they were trying to do was to create the belief that slaves were well treated and better off than people who were expected to work in a factory um, for 14 hours a day. The effects of the Fugitive Slave Law and the tug on you know, the two texts that Americans in the 19th century would have held most dear, the Bible and the Declaration of Independence, um, in many ways are bolstered by what we find in slave narrative after slave narrative, in which we see the incidents of slaves reporting that if masters found them to be intelligent, as Henry Bibb writes in his narrative, um, that that was pronounced the most objectionable of all qualities. And the reason why was because it then meant that, and slave owners understood that, it, that slaves would understand what freedom and liberty meant. So as he writes about running away here, they also see in it a love for freedom, patriotism, insurrection, bloodshed, and exterminating war against American slavery. And so this, um, right around 1850, we start to see a real increase in the amount of imagery and the number of images that are being produced, um, like those two. So let's look at a broadside that in many ways captures some of those many different themes that anti-slavery activists had used. And this is an image um, that is created about the life of Anthony Burns. And Anthony Burns was a slave who escaped to freedom, who was captured because of the Fugitive Slave Act, returned to slavery in the South. 
um, and they create this image um, about his life. How does this image tell the story of the life of Anthony Burns? What are the major themes that it depicts? Okay. <clears throat> How does it tell his life? Well, we have the image in the lower left there, the sail. And then um, presumably he was a fugitive slave. He's getting arrested in Boston. And then uh, he leaves Boston. We have whips imagery on the right. True. Mm -hmm. He apparently, and from the image in the lower right, he apparently becomes a, uh, a speaker. Any other comments? What is different to you about this image than the ones we've been looking at? Are there things about it that strike you as being a new way of um, depicting the story or the life of the slave or things that happen to slaves? See anything new here? Well, certainly the image at the center uh, yeah. is, is, is everything focuses our attention on that image. And that is not a runaway. That is not somebody who's pleading uh, for freedom. That's a very formidable person. Exactly. Um, and now you are all um, uh, chatting in with exactly what is really so remarkable and new about this image. It's about an individual. It's about a person who has a life. He is portrayed as a gentleman. He is dressed um, in the appropriate clothing of the gentleman. Um, and in the center, he is shown not as a slave, right? So much of the imagery around it is related to his life as a slave, but the image in the center shows him as a free man um, and no longer as a slave. Um, one of you writes, dignified and intelligent man. It is a dramatic departure from, if you think all the way back to the supplicant slave at the beginning, am I not a man and a brother? That was a man who was in many ways powerless to affect his own freedom. And here is Anthony Byrne, a man who's been very active in obtaining his own freedom. And as um, Angela is writing, pushing the issue of equality very much and very strongly. Um, so it's a dramatically different way to represent both the topic of slavery, but also it creates a very different message than those that were presented, you know, 60 years earlier. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that our time is drawing nigh, and so I want to give you two last images um, for us to look at because it gets us to the point of 1861 um, and two very different images, which pick up on earlier themes and do new things with it. Um, these were two paintings both painted by British artists, both um, exhibited in London in 1861, um, and that tell different stories about American slavery. Now, before we talk about the images, I just need to note that there really isn't anywhere in America that American artists um, could have easily shown paintings like this. The topic was politically so hot that artists were concerned about their own patronage, and they usually shied away from politically sensitive topics. And so we really see European artists commenting more directly on slavery than we see many American artists. So here we have two very different stories, Air Crow's Slaves Waiting for Sale and Richard Ansel's Hunted Slave. Um, and I'd like to hear from you, um, what stories of slavery these images tell, um, and um, you know which one you think might be the more effective. Okay, Crow's picture is so placid. <clears throat> Good word for it, placid. In sharp contrast to uh, Hansdell's picture, Hunt and Slave is more effective. We're going back to the issue of effectiveness once again. Submissive, I, I would imagine the submissive one is the crow picture. Okay. Women are awaiting their fate. 
Ansel's work calls heavily on classical Greek allegorical painting. Yes. And again, in my response on the uh, Ansel picture, I mean, those are formidable people, once again. Peaceful versus, versus chaotic. chaotic. Lots of comments on the tone of the pictures. The runaway suggesting so many things. And the runaway, of course, you know, having been a theme that artists or that had shown up in those little iconic broadsides over and over again. And the runaway being the theme of most um, slave, former slave narratives. There are no wicked whites in the Ansel painting, right? The white surrogates are really the dogs there who are um, attacking. A man protecting his wife. Now, the critics in 1861 found the Ansdale overly dramatic. And they preferred the crow image because of its, um, what they saw as the emotional poignancy of the waiting for sale. So they reacted to the fact that it wasn't the sort of theatrical representation of an auction, but instead the moment before as people pondered their fate. What is your response to the take of the critics in 1861? The Dan is more effective for us because we have a different sensibility. Well, actually, from what we read about the slave auctions, <clears throat> it seems that the crow image may actually be more accurate. Ah, good point. And one of the interesting things about the crow image is he is the one of the only artists, and he is the only artist who's a, a really fine painter exhibiting at this level, who ever saw a slave auction. He visited Richmond. Well, he visited America and in Richmond went to one of the slave auction rooms, went to multiple of the slave auction rooms, made sketches on the spot. And this painting and a number of other images that he made came from those direct observations. Um, and one of the things that the critics picked up on was what they would have seen as a verisimilitude, a truthfulness to replicating the details of the place. And he had also published a number of articles describing his experience in the auction room that, um, that he wrote about being an eyewitness account. And so it's likely that a lot of those critics knew he had seen it, and thus they sensed a truthfulness to his um, that they didn't see in Ansel, who actually had never been to America. Um, so that Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to read some of the comments. Okay. Well, Judith Batten has an interesting question there. Were there paintings depicting slave life by American artists that were then presented after slavery ended? Yes. And we see it emerging very soon after, even during the Civil War and then after the Civil War, um, depicted with um, considerable frequency in the period of Reconstruction less often immediately after the end of Reconstruction, and then again coming back in the sort of 1890s and early 20th century, but by then sanitized and represented in a sort of romantic, good old South sort of way. Um, others of you are commenting about um, the dress. And again, we know from his comments that this is a very accurate depiction of how slaves were dressed for sale, um, turned into commodities. Um, the Crow picture does not suggest the humili humiliation um, and seems to play into the make-believe. Uh, Ansel's male has the pose of a hero. There's you know, no doubt that Ansel is drawing directly from uh, earlier artwork and um, sort of Greek and Roman precedent, as some of you were mentioning. Um, critics in 1861 probably didn't want negative attention brought to the issue of slavery with the start of the war. Um, you know, again, like New York City, Britain is in a complicated place. They have both anti-slavery activists and pro-slavery people who are making a lot of money from American cotton. 
Um, so it's a hot political issue there, like it would have been in New York. Um, I, we are nearing the end of our time tonight. Um, do any of you have any final comments or questions that you would like to ask? Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> this is your last shot before we wrap up this evening. And we address all of your questions. Any final comments, questions? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you what we have here. Uh, when did image of slavery by African Americans begin to appear by African Americans? Laurie? Um, not until later. Um, it is there. There are so few African Americans who are trained as visual artists, and the ones who are are mostly doing the work that is expected of them. So there are a number of portrait painters or landscape painters. Probably the earliest known image is an African-American painter called Robert Scott Duncanson, who replicates in paint one of the images from Uncle Tom's cabin. Um, but it's not a particularly anti-slavery image. Um, so it's really not until after the war that you see African-American artists commenting on slavery directly. Okay, good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you that the forum will be up and we'll be monitoring it through October 22nd and Preston McGinnis will be available there to answer questions and respond to your comments. Please and don't can I, can I yes. just say one thing, one of the questions on there, a particular source on the internet for additional images of slavery, there is uh -huh. an excellent um, uh, internet, there's an excellent web source um, put together by a colleague of mine at the University of Virginia or really at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and I will put that into the forum so that everybody can have access to it. Um, it's, a, it's a really amazing set um, of digitized images that you can use in your teaching and that you would find very helpful. Okay, great. Well, that's good to know. Well, Maury, I want to thank you very much for an excellent seminar this evening, and I want to thank all of their participants, all of our participants, rather, for their attention and their intelligent participation. Yes, Please, thank ladies you and gentlemen. Some great questions. Yes, they were really, really remarkable. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I hope we will see you again or uh, see evidence of you, hear you, and, and read your chat in our upcoming seminars. Please uh, uh, be with us again. Now, to uh, escape the virtual classroom, ladies and gentlemen, you go up to the upper left-hand side of your screen where you see the word file. Click on that. There'll be a drop-down menu, and the last item is something like exit the session. Uh, again, thank you very much, and good evening.